I'd like you to take a walk with me, a walk through your memory. Do you remember the first US president you saw on television? You remember your first date? I remember the first time I fell in love, I was wearing a rubber suit. <laughs> Fins, a mask, a cylinder of air on my back. On my first dive, 35 years ago, just a few steps from here, I found this shell, shell of a black abalone. In the years I've been looking at it since then, it's taken on greater meaning because I haven't seen a black abalone alive in the last 20 years. I've spent much of the last three decades photographing in California's coastal ocean. I've had experiences that filled me with awe, elation, even a sense of reverence. And I've watched the local ocean change, mostly not for the better. I know what's happened since I began diving here, but this made me wonder, what about before? What if I had been able to dive here 100 years ago, 200 years ago? What might an image of yesterday's ocean tell us about decisions we're making today? Based on research I've done, my own experiences underwater, illustrating with some photographs I've taken and many taken from historical archives, I'd like to share with you my attempts at answering that question. 200 years ago, Russians came down the California coast from the Aleutians and began hunting sea otters. In as little as a dozen years, they reduced the population so much they couldn't make a profit, and they left. We are still feeling the ecological reverberations today. Studies suggest the historic population of sea otters was five to seven times the current level. Sea otters, to keep warm, eat something like a third of their body weight in things like crabs, clams, uh, abalone, and sea urchins each day. Urchins, in turn, feed on the kelp that forms lush underwater forests. When urchins multiply out of control, they chew away at the base of the kelp. And in Southern California, where the otters have yet to repopulate, there are places where urchins have gone out of control and we've seen whole ecosystems literally drift away. The causes of this kind of ecological collapse are complicated, but most scientists agree that when otters are present, they prevent this from happening. Abalone eat kelp after it dies, which is a good thing for the kelp forest because during most of the 19th century, while the otters were gone from all of the California coast, abalone exploded in numbers. Historically, abalone had just two predators, the otters and the natives of the central California coast in this area, the Rumsian people. For the Rumsian, abalone was a dietary staple and their shells were a source of tools, ornaments, and items for trade. One researcher believes that California natives may have taken as much as four million pounds of abalone a year, and they did it for millennia. In 1853, Chinese came to this village in Monterey and formed similar fishing villages like this up and down the coast. Using small wooden boats like these and long poles, they pried abalone from rocks in shallow water. The technique spread all the way down the coast into Mexico. And by 1879, this rudimentary low-tech fishery managed to take 4 million pounds of abalone and shells from the California coast. The Chinese Exclusion Acts of the 1880s barred the Chinese from entry, and their businesses soon disappeared. But in 1895, an immigrant from Japan discovered the abalone a carpet along the Monterey shoreline. And soon, starting just down the road at Point Lobos, hard hat divers were working up and down the California coast, taking abalone again. In 1899, a reporter here in Monterey wrote, the commercial harvesters soon had them cleared off the rocks above the water for several miles around. That year, the county supervisors responded by banning abalone fishing onshore or with poles. A Department of Fish and Game report explained they had become alarmed at the species' rapid depletion. Now, 100 years ago, politics in the country were such that environmentalism was in favor. And Cal the state of California, 
between 1907 and 13 formed six special areas in the ocean to conserve marine life. The very first in 07 declared the Monterey Peninsula's entire northern shore a no-take area for all invertebrates. Nowadays, we would call this a marine protected area. Although it was taken off the books in 1933, this one would have met scientific guidelines established 96 years later. California's abalone reached a high level in 1952 and managed to stay there for 17 years. But wasn't, what wasn't truly understood and certainly not acted upon at the time was that high level of output was maintained by exploitation of five different species in series. Species by species, area by area, not just one animal, but a whole genus was depleted from the entire California coast, from the Golden Gate down into Baja, California. A steep decline began in 1970, and after this carpet of abalone was peeled away by commercial divers, sport divers, like me, followed. I remember taking abalone north of Santa Cruz in the early 1980s and up in Half Moon Bay. In the late 80s, I was still able to get abalone in the Channel Islands, in Southern California, but they were becoming hard to find. What I didn't realize that I was seeing and I was participating in was 170 years of accidental history. Regulation came late. After all, there were livelihoods at stake. By 1997, there were very few commercial abalone divers left to protest quite loudly when their industry was ended by law. A commentary by a state biologist summed up the issue. The threatened extermination of the abalone is a real danger. For instance, near Avalon, Santa Catalina Island, not more than 20 years ago, the green abalones were so thick that they rested four or five deep, one upon another, all over the rocks. After much searching in this locality, I was unable to find a single specimen. It would be very advantageous to establish a number of protected reservations, similar to those at Monterey Bay, at regular intervals along the coast. Now, the language in that quote sounds a little antiquated because it was written in 1913. The California legislature did enact a law doing exactly what the author called for, 86 years later. What is the natural status of abalone populations? My personal impression of that was formed in 1979 as abalone were reaching the bottom of a hundred year long skid from a human induced population explosion. Even what I remember from then no longer exists. What kind of ecosystem could produce enough abalone to feed five times today's otter population and still leave enough left that natives with no dive gear could take them by the millions for centuries or millennia on end. Is that amazing picture our natural ocean? Could we ever see it here again? Thin fish populations are also not what they once were. My first hint came from looking at schools of blue rockfish like this one. I got three pictures of big schools in the early 1990s. In later years, they seemed to me that the schools were harder to find, and the individual fish size had become smaller. And looking at data confirmed my impression. Blue rockfish were being fished faster than they could grow and reproduce. I found out also that yellow eye rockfish and canary rockfish were in worse shape. Now, they had not been on my radar at all, because in my first 25 years of diving, I'd never photographed or even seen an example of either of those species. Fishing for both has been banned for over a decade. Now, those are two of the eight species we have that can live to be over 75 years old. The yellow eye can live over 115. Despite the fishing ban, recovery of the most depleted, slow-growing fish is expected to take as long as a century. In 2007, at Arena Rock near Mendocino, I finally found this, my first yellow eye rockfish, along with many, many others. But I have yet to find an adult at any other spot. In 2010, diving off the Big Sur coast, I found this tiny juvenile yellow eye rockfish. And two years later, several more. In 2008, 
I finally spotted and photographed my first canary rockfish. Last September, exactly five years after the establishment of the marine protected areas on the central coast, I found a cluster of rockfish just south of Point Lobos in an area that had been declared a no-take marine reserve five years before. Rockfish spend their whole lives in a very small area, but salmon migrate from the sea into coastal streams to spawn. In 2008 and 9, when salmon runs failed, there was hardly any local catch at all. A hundred years before, they had seemed infinite. In 1892, Jay Parker Whitney arrived in Monterey Peninsula and spent a season fishing salmon. He saw a pack of orcas chasing a huge school of salmon, which in turn were feeding on even bigger schools of anchovies and sardines. In that season, Whitney caught 5,231 pounds of salmon himself in three months. Monterey's fishing community learned to fish salmon from him, and in two years, their catch went from 5,000 pounds to 95,000 pounds. Historian Tim Thomas told me that before that, in the native era, the Rumsian people had a unique fishing technique. They'd wade into the Carmel River, wait for the spawning salmon to pass, and then dip in, hook a salmon under the gills, flip it onto the shore. Can you imagine? Those salmon no longer spawn in the Carmel River or any of other Central California's coastal waterways, and the big schools aren't here anymore. During World War I, Monterey's top catch began to shift from salmon towards sardines, which were here in such amazing numbers that the industry employed something like 5,000 people in the Monterey area and kept the peninsula prosperous through the depths of the Great Depression. The Monterey Peninsula Herald devoted an issue each year to sardines. From 1934 through 46, the catch averaged well over a billion pounds, that's with a B, billion pounds a season. The state's head biologist, Francis Clark, along with John Steinbeck's famous friend, Edward F. Ricketts, wrote in the Herald that the catches were not sustainable, but state attempts to set limits met with fierce resistance. Hindsight analysis of what killed off the sardine industry remains a controversial topic. Most sources suggest a mix of overfishing superimposed on a natural cycle of population variation. As Ricketts wrote in the 1947 issue, amidst the hunt for the sardines that had disappeared, the answer to the question, where are the sardines, becomes obvious. They're in cans. <laughs> the next year he wrote, we mustn't regard overfishing as the only factor in the present disaster, but it's the only one over which we have any control. We now know that catching a billion pounds a year is unsustainable, but in today's ocean, it also seems impossible. Sightings of sharks in Central California are rare. In Southern California, divers occasionally see the soup fin shark. In 1938, soup fin sharks could be found all over California, and that was the year they became big business because their livers were found to be rich in vitamin A. From 1938 to 41, California fishermen took in 32 million pounds of sharks, mostly soup fins. But by the mid-40s, the Department of Fish and Game was complaining of a serious depletion of the soup fin shark from the heavy fishing effort. As the fishery crashed, shark, uh, soup fin shark livers became worth their weight in silver. In 1950, synthetic vitamin A was developed, and a fishery which had exhausted its product also lost its market. I wish I had enough time to tell you what I learned researching fish like this lingcod, tuna, cabazon, basking sharks, black sea bass, whales, and more. Suffice it to say, each of these species became the target of a fishery that accelerated rapidly, peaked, and then faded because of at least one of three factors. Scarcity, replacement in the marketplace, or usually rarely and late regulation. Protecting areas in the ocean, as we do with parks on land, will prevent whatever the next rush is from further degrading ecosystems in those protected areas. 
Contemplating the repeated cycles of boom and bust makes me think about carpentry. I like to build things with tools and lumber. There is not a master carpenter that can turn two by fours back into a tree. Perhaps we should think of things that we cannot create ourselves as sacred. Indeed, many congregations are beginning to adopt stewardship of what they consider creation as a core value. I'm sure you've heard as many downer talks about environmental damage as I have, and frankly, I hate them. <laughs> so I made myself a promise before I got deep into marine conservation uh, that I would not do one of those talks, and in fact, I was going to get into something in which I could make a difference, and you could too. So one way to be part of the solution is to make sure that the things we buy or order in a restaurant are labeled sustainably green by seafoodwatch.org or fishwise.org. Now, that's an important minute to take, but we need a big idea to protect whole ecosystems in the ocean. And fortunately, we have that big idea. They are these marine protected areas. And in 1999, our state, California, passed a law calling for that string of marine protected areas coastwide um, from north to south along our, the California coast. The network was completed after 13 years of work just last year. 173 countries now have marine protected areas. And recently, John Kerry supported a proposal to create a no-take area off Antarctica four times the size of California. It'll take 25 countries to agree, but we hope they'll do it. What lived in the areas that are now California's MPAs? decades or centuries ago, my attempt to sketch out a mental image relies on pictures and accounts of what we took out of the ocean over the last couple of centuries. The repeated exploitation of many species in boom and bust cycles suggests that their historic populations were far larger than what we see today. This sketch of yesterday's ocean can offer us a hopeful vision of what we may see reappearing in these new areas. Off central California's coast, we've dedicated 18% to marine protected areas of any type, just 7.5% to completely protected no-take areas. In these little patches that Sylvia Earle refers to as hope spots, our hopes are being nurtured, but its beginnings are already being measured. I think that taking care of these areas, watching them carefully, Waiting patiently is a big idea worth spreading. Thank you.